All right, let's just jump in. Um, I want the majority of this time to be available for, for us to interact around your specific questions, but I do want to open with just some uh, context and background, um, and then I, I'm more than happy to share my screen and walk through um, any very detailed questions you all might have, or we can uh, keep it high level, really whatever serves your purposes the most. Um, so uh, my name is Joseph. I think I know all of you, but um, I serve as the executive director at the foundation. Um, I'm really excited about this grant opportunity. And uh, the primary reason is that um, with this, this opportunity is um, specifically designed for uh, almost the sense of backfilling COVID losses, um, which a lot of other grant opportunities are not necessarily explicitly talking about um, being able to do that. So from a high level, I wanna make sure that um, we, we remember that um, this opportunity is uh, ha using federal dollars. Um, and so from a very basic uh, stance or starting place, um, this, this grant opportunity is a reimbursement grant, grant opportunity um, and is coming with some documentation requirements that um, might be a little bit more um, unique or in-depth than other grant opportunities um, you've applied for, definitely through the foundation, but any other sort of uh, private foundation grants are generally not going to ask for some of the documentation we will. Um, so I just wanted to kind of put that out there at the start, that the reason we're asking for the documentation we're asking for is that this is a reimbursement grant. And that works uh, not only from your lens, but from our lens as well. And so when we approached the town of Buena Vista, the city of Salida, and the county governments with this proposal, um, the whole idea was based in the fact that uh, we wanted to be able to unlock more dollars for Chafee nonprofits and even for businesses as it relates to youth services. Um, and yet we would be uh, reviewing and, and approving applications. Then we are turning around submitting a, an invoice to those governments based on a formula of how they funded the program. Then once we get paid, we're paying you. So it's not only reimbursement from your standpoint, um, it's also reimbursement from our standpoint. Um, so I just wanted to lay that as a ground groundwork piece to sort of put in context some of the things that we'll go through. Um, I am going to go ahead and share my screen just to be able to walk through a couple of pieces here um, and make sure that we're all on the same page. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Um, so to start with, um, I want to take us to the, the CRF uh, page on our website. Um, I think you all are probably have already been through this, um, but I just wanted to call this out as one of the central places for um, both uh, information, but also some frequently asked questions um, down here that are a little bit more generic. Um, also wanted to call out that the reimbursement form that we'll talk about in a moment is available uh, from this web page before you even get into the portal. Um, so, uh, and then we've also posted the evaluation rubric. So how will we be deciding or approving grants um, is posted right here on this website. So just wanted to make sure to call attention to those couple of pieces. Um, And then we'll, we'll hop on over. Um, if you click the apply here link, it's going to bring you to our grants portal. Um, looking at who's on the call, most of you are familiar with this portal. Um, so if for some reason you're not, um, you're gonna go ahead and click the create new account if you don't currently have account in here. Um, just sort of follow the steps, set up your organization and your user, and then you'll be able to search not only our grants, but also other grants that are available in the county in here. Um, so before I move too much further, um, I wanna just lay the groundwork for the two main buckets that are within this program. 
um, touch on a couple of the high level pieces of those two buckets. And then I wanna open it up to you all uh, for your pressing questions. Um, and that will kind of guide where we go from here. But I'm also well, uh, happy to do sort of more of a detailed walkthrough um, of the application itself. So um, as you all probably know, there are two main buckets in this grant uh, opportunity. Um, the first and largest bucket is the nonprofit support bucket. Um, there's up to $140,000 available for funding. Each organization can apply for up to $7,500 or 20% of their operating budget, whichever is less. Um, so the idea there being obviously, um, if you're a tiny organization, say under $30,000 of annual revenue, um, you will not be able to qualify or ask for that full $7,500. However, if you're you know, anywhere in the um, 50 to $100,000 range or higher, um, then you would be capped by the $7,500. Um, so the idea behind the nonprofit grant bucket uh, is really to say, did you experience COVID-related losses, um, COVID-related expenses, or did you implement uh, new programming that meets a COVID-related need in the community? If any one of those answers is yes, then you can apply to that bucket of, of funding. Um, you can also apply to that bucket of funding for, for all of those things together. It doesn't have to be one or the other. So uh, a quick example of a loss might be that because of the public health uh, restrictions, you were not able to hold your uh, fundraising event in May, and you can show us your 2019 uh, budget when, in financials that show you earned $5,000 from that fundraiser. Um, you're gonna be able to ask for up to $5,000 for that fundraising loss because it's directly tied to COVID. Um, because of COVID, you had to cancel. Um, an example of an expense could be anything uh, that you can tie directly to COVID. So if you had to purchase uh, cleaning supplies, um, personal protective equipment, uh, if you had to purchase you know, plexiglass dividers for your office space or uh, implement some physical, restrict, physical distancing in your facilities, um, any of that that's due to COVID would qualify as a COVID-related expense. And then finally, that piece of COVID-related programming. Um, obviously, the pandemic has, has had many, many, many community impacts. And when we look at basic needs, um, if your organization started a, a program or a new partnership or something like that to meet a basic need related to COVID, then you can apply for reimbursement of those program expenses, including staff time, including um, transportation or facilities costs. So an example might be if you uh, don't normally have a food box program, but you implemented a new food box program in response to uh, the COVID pandemic, then you could apply for reimbursement of the food or the transportation to take it or the uh, staff time to coordinate that program, all of those pieces. So all of that is under that nonprofit support bucket. And you'll see when we look at the application that it will ask you almost right away whether you're applying for nonprofit support or youth programming. And so in this case, you do need to choose one of those two. But then once you choose nonprofit support, you'll be able to describe and uh, upload documentation for any of those, those things that I mentioned. The second main bucket is youth programming. And this is really um, uh, designed to uh, reimburse expenses for or give certainty to implement new uh, youth programming as it relates to COVID. Um, so an example here is um, if there are students that are now remote learning because the schools um, have either partially or fully shut down or um, they offered that as an option and that family chose to go to remote learning, that's directly tied to COVID. And any, any entity, uh, this bucket is not, is not uh, relegated to nonprofits, but businesses and churches and others can apply to that bucket. Any entity that, that um, ensures a safe and healthy environment for students as it relates to COVID um, could apply for reimbursement of those costs, 
including staff time, including facilities, equipment, food, all of those different pieces of what they, what they did for youth. The caveat here, as with the nonprofit support, is that you have to be able to demonstrate that if not but for COVID, you would not have that expense. So this is, this is saying um, you need to demonstrate in your application that if COVID had not happened, you would not have done this thing or you would have you know, gone about your normal business. So this is the crucial piece, especially for youth programming. Um, Kristen, for instance, um, your normal uh, programming with youth would not be eligible for this bucket of funding unless you can demonstrate that you did something unique um, related to COVID for those, those girls, right? So um, that sort of if not but for COVID is a really important phrase that goes all the way up to the US Treasury and their guidance around how these CARES Act dollars can be spent. So just keep that in mind as you're formulating your responses and putting together your documentation. Um, if not but for COVID, I wouldn't be asking for money, basically. And you need to you need to tell the full story there. So um, I'll stop there. I don't want to walk too much into the portal um, until or unless there's specific questions about the um, mechanics of the application itself. But I'm I'm happy to go there if there aren't any pressing questions at the moment. So if you have a question, um, please feel free to just jump in. Go ahead, Amy. Real quick, can, can you apply for both or do you have to choose one or the other? It's a great question. So you will, you can apply for both. Um, however, uh, there's sort of an extra burden of proof, I guess I would say, um, that you are applying for distinct reasons, right? So especially in your case, Amy, right? Um, you need to be able to very clearly delineate what might be considered a loss for your general organization due to COVID versus um, your expenses related to providing COVID related programming for youth. Um, so if you can demonstrate that you have very unique costs in both buckets, then you could fill out two different applications, one for each bucket. That would be allowed. <clears throat> Any other high level questions at the moment or should I jump into the portal? Are you gonna cover what are the preferred additional documents beyond what is required that you would prefer to see? Sure, yep. So I'll, I'll jump into the portal and I'll answer that question as we walk through the application. Um, so again, uh, this should look familiar. Um, to you if you're familiar with the portal at all or you you fill out our applications um, we're going to go up to the apply button and enter CRF um, as our access code I'm guessing that you've all have read this information but um, just for those that might be listening uh, to the recording please make sure that you read all of this information in detail and thoroughly before you start your application this we just covered most of this, um, but it's just really important that you are thinking about all of these pieces before you actually start your application. I will say the other kind of overarching piece here is that um, you can apply before you incur an expense if you want to propose new programming or if you are proposing something new that you haven't already spent the money for. So an example here might be, let's say that the, the BV library wants to offer um, remote learning centers and programming for when the school district shut down um, and they want to provide lunch and activities and supplies for the kids, right? So, but they don't, they can't do that um, if they don't know they're going to be able to get it funded. So they could put, submit an application with that idea, detail, you know, detail what the budget would be, um, why it's related to COVID, answer all the questions as if they've already done it. And we will assess that and issue sort of a pre-commitment or a pre-approval letter for up to a certain amount of funding. Um, this could be really useful uh, if you 
would are thinking about doing something but really don't want to take the chance. Um, the caveat there being that all the expenses that you uh, do end up submitting have to be spent by November 30th. Um, we cannot reimburse you for expenses after November 30th, just given the timeline of this whole uh, program. So if you're going to implement something over the next month um, or two months, and you want a pre-commitment letter to pay for those expenses, then you can submit an application ahead of time. And you don't have to wait until November 30th to introduce the idea. So just as a way to lower the risk a little bit, um, especially on the youth programming side. But that could also apply for meeting general community needs that are related to COVID on the nonprofit side. So once we're ready, um, we'll click apply and, and get going on the actual application. Um, pretty self-explanatory uh, in name and mission statement. Uh, we ask for a, a program's overview um, because as you'll see, if you want to look at the rubric, which I pointed out on our web page, um, really the only subjective criteria here that is being applied to the review of these is whether or not your organization serves basic needs. If you serve basic needs, you will be um, prioritized over those that don't if there is